So one of the big concepts, once now that we know what an ESA is, and now that we know that there's different ways to deploy it and that we can leverage a listener, um, one of the ways that we can start to lock down this listener is through the use of a host access table or what we call a hat. We can control the incoming connections. So determining a sender group for remote hosts as well as applying a mail flow policy for a match sender group. What this means when we talk about sender groups, people that we're gonna be receiving emails from. Um, when I receive emails from other people, how should I respond? What should my thresholds and limits be? You can be very, very broad with this, or you can be a bit more specific. And again, we can do different hats for different interfaces. So as they say in our next bullet point, different actions supported based on a listener type. If we've got a public listener, our hat accepts email from all hosts. Why is that? We don't know who's gonna send us an email. It could be any host on the internet, so it's a little bit difficult to whitelist. Uh, my recipient access table talks about like, well, who am I actually accepting emails for? I'm not accepting emails for gmail.com, but I might be uh, accepting emails for cisco.com. Now, when we look at your private listener, this tends to be a bit different. This is gonna accept email from your internal email server and deny all of their hosts. So what we're doing here is effectively whitelisting whoever exchanges. If we've got an exchange server, we go, okay, cool. That server is allowed to send us SMTP email. Somebody else used Nmap, did a port scan, found all our, our listener, tried to push a, a relay, a bunch of spam through us. Nope, we won't accept it. Why? Because you're not in that host access table. So you can see how different these are. Again, with the public side, accept it from everybody. On the private side, only you know, appropriate hosts. So our host access table looks a bit like this. Um, you've got your listeners below and appropriately named incoming mail and outgoing mail. Okay, what is that? It means on data one, we're handling incoming email. Data two, outgoing email. What port are we listening to? The default 25. Remember, you could change that. For host access tables, this is the name of our hat. It's just called hat. You could name it something better. It works here. Uh, and again, if we've got different host access tables, we could modify them. Again, here's our recipient access table. So as traffic comes into us, we've got a list of who will accept emails for. We say, well, you know, users at cisco.com. And they go, how about outgoing emails? And I go, oh, I don't really care who that's to. Why? Because I don't know. No idea who my internal users are communicating with. But I do know that when internal users try to communicate, it should all be coming from a specific IP. So again, just one of the mechanisms that we can leverage to lock down access into the ESA. So very similar to many of the other rules that we create within Cisco devices, we've got this top-down processing. So anytime there's top-down processing, we just try to make sure that our most uh, important or our most, I shouldn't say important, because that's gonna be more subjective, but our most specific rules are gonna be closer to the top. As a packet comes in, we're looking for a match, and of course it's gonna get assigned policy. If I have a broad statement, at the top, and I've got a specific statement here, that broad statement's gonna make a match, and you're gonna go ahead and take it. Because we've got a lot of packets to process, why look around any further? So just remember the order of operations is important. Um, a sender group, this was a term that we introduced. Uh, this is just a list of remote hosts that handle email in a certain way. So what we can do is we can define, hey, when you're receiving email from these servers, I wanna do things a bit differently. And when I say these servers, well, what am I actually using as a, uh, to define them? Could be a v4, v6 address, could be a domain name. Uh, we could be doing it based on the reputation. You know, are they somebody that's uh, typically uh, sending around a lot of spam? What does sender base say that they're at? Uh, we could leverage external threat feeds. So SBRS is uh, basically Cisco telling you this is the reputation of the sender. If you want to augment that with additional threat intelligence, we can also pull in external feeds. Again, these are all things that we use for classification when an email shows up. So an email might come in and I go, oh, it's coming from this domain, throw it away. It's like, wait, you didn't inspect the content. You didn't, you know, you know, try to, try to unzip this file and look at the contents of it. I said, no, it's too much work. I go, I know anything coming from that particular source is more trouble than it's worth. I'll toss it. And if there's real problems, well, maybe I can broaden my rule set a bit more. 
just depends on your organization. Some organizations uh, lean towards security by default, others lean towards connectivity by default. So this is pretty cool. We've got uh, a diagram here, and what they're showing you above this top left is the sender-based database. So the sender-based database gives you and I as end users really intelligent information about who it is that we're communicating with. Uh, even before Cisco acquired the company that was creating the solution called Ironport, um, the Ironport email service had this capability called Senderbase. And basically this was, at the time, years of analytics. So now I would say that it's many more years of analytics of what servers are sending what type of traffic how often. And by having a good idea of what normal is, we have an idea of what abnormal is. We can find outliers more easily. Um, this reputation scoring is very, very powerful. Um, they even took this technology and tied it into some of the things that the sensors can do, and we're calling it sensor-based. This was like a working term at the time. Um, now it's just all being kind of thrown together as threat intelligence. But what you want to appreciate is any other user that opted in that's out there running an ESA, as they're getting attacks, as they're getting this garbage thrown at them, they're notifying Cisco. They're like, hey, this guy just you know, came in and caused all these problems, here's the IP address. And we go, okay. And we don't immediately like globally blacklist that person, but we remember. We go, okay, you know what? We've seen them doing that before, and we're gonna note it here. And then basically when you communicate with sender base, they're gonna give you a copy of their database that's, that's telling you, hey, these particular IP addresses are just no good. They're nobody that you want to communicate with. And the likelihood that you'd want to communicate somebody is represented with what we call a sender-based reputation score, or SBRS. And this ranges from negative 10 to positive 10. Um, and then what we can do is set a score for like who's going to follow on each of these particular uh, ranges. So when traffic comes in, we look at the reputation score, we determine is this a good guy, a bad guy, or unknown? And then based on that classification, we can of course take actions. Should the email be throttled? Maybe we only accept a small quantity of emails from them every so often. Should it be blocked outright? So we just don't even let it in because they're bad guys. Um, do we go ahead and accept it? And maybe in some cases we forward it without analysis. Um, really just comes down to how the scoring lays out and this is something that you can customize within your policies. So there's gonna be predefined mail flows that exist for you. Cisco tries to make it really easy to get this up and running uh, in the most logical way. And then once it's up and running, we can tweak and tune it as necessary. When we go in and we start to identify things, so I go, you know what, I see traffic, it's coming from somebody that I know is a bad guy, what do we wanna do? We can accept, relay, reject, uh, do a TCP refuse, where we can do uh, just basically continue processing. The mail flow policy overview, uh, some of the additional parameters that you can set are connection limits. How many connections simultaneously we accept? The rate limits, how many emails can they send? How big? How many recipients in a single email? How many people can be carbon copied? So we can define some thresholds and remember that these thresholds can, base, can, can alter based on sending group. So a lot of folks sit down, you're learning it all for the first time, okay, let's just get it up and running. But once it's been running for a bit, once you've got some pain points or challenges, realize that you've got the granular controls to come in and make specific policies for specific scenarios to really kind of custom build a solution that you want. So as far as editing the host access table on public or private listeners, uh, in this scenario here, it says it seems like my partners in the domain Juliet.com are not receiving the emails that I sent. And then across the, the, on the other side, they say every single email I send gets denied, no matter what destination domain is. A lot of reasons for this. Um, you know, sometimes people use cloud services where it's a shared server, and you've got many servers sharing a single IP. If there's another tenant at that IP that's doing bad things, you're going to look like you're them. Um, Additionally, if your company is aggressive in your advertising, there's a real good chance that you can be put on a blacklist. I've helped companies that have been on blacklist many times, uh, and a lot of you know none of them were nefarious companies. They just 
got a little too carried away or their marketing person made a mistake or two on an ad campaign and they just got blacklisted. And getting off those lists is pretty difficult. So, you know, maybe we deploy the ESA, we think that we're helping the company, we're saving money, and then we get really upset project managers that come in and they're yelling at us because they're not getting the emails that they think they should get. Great. We've got detailed analytics, we've got great monitoring. We can figure out and do searches what's happening for emails for that particular domain. Once we know, remember our tables that we create define the policies that we take for specific users. So this is a, just kind of like a great example for you, you built a default policy, you used your best um, guesses based on education and, and experience, and it's just not doing quite what you had hoped, and we got to do some tweaking. Well, what's happening here is we see that the, the sender-based reputation score is negative four. So what can we do? Well, if you look at the way that the hat works, we're leveraging the sender-based reputation score. And look, this is on incoming mail. There's our listener. You see the IP address in port 25. When email comes in, if it's rated in these zones, this is what we're doing. So if somebody comes in negative four, they're gonna get blocked. That's what it's supposed to do. That's not a problem. That's this thing working exactly as it was designed. So what we could do is we could create a separate rule that applies to traffic that comes from that one server. Or globally, we could just adjust sender base and have them block less things. In my experience, it tends to be go in and make an exception for that individual domain. Don't, you know, don't move your whole sender base score for that one customer.